You are listening to Upfront. I'm Kat Brooks in conversation with Kali Akunu about his work with Cooperation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi. The Jackson Cush plan is based on the conditions in Jackson, mm-hmm. right? What, mm-hmm. are, what are the proper responses for the population, the economy, the land? The capital of Mississippi is a place where the past has full partnership with the present. Confederate memorials are real symbols not only of a century-old conflict, but of a present-day conflict, too. We have a Tea Party supermajority that runs our state legislature, and they can basically legislate almost everything that they will. As you know, I've requested a workforce requirement for abled-bodied adults from the Center of Medicaid and Medicare Services. It will actually help this population reap the rewards of a good job and one day receive health care coverage from their employer, not the state or federal government. Now, politically, you know, Jackson... Uh, kind of sits on the tail end of what we call the the Cush District, which is a string of majority black counties that runs basically from Memphis, Tennessee, almost all the way down to New Orleans. This is your historic, you know, black belt region named for both the richness of the soil and the African people who worked this soil, who made, you know, Mississippi at one period of time for about 30, 40 years, the richest state in the country. Well, Jackson was one of the richest cities in the country. One one of the richest, richest cities in the country. Uh, and now it's one of the poorest. We're talking under slavery. Yeah, under slavery. Now it's one of the, one of the poorest. The, the scene is you have this very impoverished capital uh, in, you know, the, the, the heart of old Dixie uh, that has basically been left uh, to rot. And then some radicals come along with an audacious uh, program that says, hey, we could do some things to transform the society. Let me be clear. The two pieces that I think are more kind of support pillars is building the solidarity economy. And that is where cooperation in Jackson is really situated. And to come up with the resources to, let's be honest, to withstand uh, attacks. So it's not just some idealist stuff that we're trying to get to. Uh, it's really, truth be told, in preparation, as far as I'm concerned, for struggle, serious struggle. So we start with this notion, look, Capitalism is not going to save us. It's not producing any jobs. It's not going to improve you know, our, our livelihoods or get, provide people with a means of a livelihood. We have to take the onus of doing that ourselves. And what are the things that we can control that are within our immediate grasp? What are the things that we already have the skills to actually you know, work on and scale up on to provide our basic needs? Like That's our starting point. And we start with the notion that there's tons of human skill in our community. Folks who know how to fix almost anything, folks who know how to grow almost anything. We've been starting different cooperatives, and one of the, those cooperatives is the Urban Farming Cooperative. And it's in a neighborhood that doesn't have access to a grocery store, doesn't have access to, to, to fresh produce. And so we're trying to do that um, just to show our community that um, that we care and that we can provide the things that we need for ourselves. The second component of that is the independent politics. And I think it's the most popular or most noted dimension of the overall program uh, because of the victories of, of Chokwe Lumumba and Chokwe Antar Lumumba. Well, Jackson, Mississippi is back in the news this week after veteran black nationalist and civil rights attorney Chokwe Lumumba was elected mayor of the city. I want to say hey and hello. All right, I want to say free the land. Free the land. Like, that's the piece that's going to really drive the social transformation in the long run. But ours is much more rooted in the history of the mass associations, the mass meetings, the mass gatherings in the civil rights struggle, in the black power struggle of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, where people came together to determine, you know, how we're going to fight against the citizens' councils. If you want to know how integration has been held outside Mississippi for this long, you must first call on the citizens' council an organization dedicated to states' rights and racial integrity. Support comes from Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and 85,000 living white citizens of Mississippi. The overwhelming political power of the council is well demonstrated by the fact that it is partially supported by state taxes. William Simmons is secretary of the Jackson Citizens Council, editor of its newspaper and president of its forum, which produced radio and television programs attacking the advance of integration. The South has a large Negro population. Uh, In our state, it's about 42% of the total. And anyone with two eyes in his head and with uh, roughly normal vision can look around him and see that there's a vast and 
permanent difference. So there's a baseline history that already existed in Jackson that was a, a part of this type of tradition. Now, the thing with those is that they were often what we would call episodic. They might last for six, seven months, serve a particular purpose, and then kind of fade away. And building on our experience, really starting collective experience, starting in the 1980s, Jackson didn't become a majority black city until the 1980s. And as a result of that kind of rapid transition, Jackson in the 1980s had a police chief uh, who was an open Klan member. And out of that resistance came for uh, the People's Convention. And then over a course of like two or three years of fighting this police chief and then getting him to be fired, ultimately. And so that People's Convention transformed into a vehicle by, whereby a consensus process was created to try to determine a person to run for mayor and people to run as a slate for city council. That was in 1992 and 1993. But the thing that we have tried to focus on over the years, but particularly since 2005, to try and keep putting out critical questions that, that affect everybody in the community in one way or another and say, what do we think about this? We think these questions are so important that they shouldn't just be left to the city council or the mayor to decide. There are some things that we would like to do to improve our community that the government cannot do, either because it does not have the will or does it not have the resources. We can do that and have an obligation to do it ourselves. And to do that in the broadest, most democratic way possible, because we all believe that there's profound human capacity, which can be organized, that does not necessarily entail money or capital to move a program forward. So we're trying to introduce that. So one of the things that we are definitely going to try to experiment with this year to deal with some of these immediate issues is organizing a large time bank. Time banks are a way for community members to share the things they love to do using time instead of money as currency. The concept is simple. You spend one hour doing something for someone in your community, and then you earn one time dollar that goes into the time bank. Now you can spend your time dollar by having someone do something for you. And organizing, you know, from some South American models, what they call trekkies, which our people would call a swap meet, right? And with those two things, we're, we're saying, hey, we already know people got practice of you give me some child care, I can help you with cooking something. Now let's formalize that. Mm. That's where the time banking piece comes in. And so that you can start doing certain forms of trade with that that don't extend to just your relatives or your immediate friends, but you can trade from one end of the city doing that. Right. So this is how we are trying to ad address, mm -hmm. you know, the development of how do we meet our people's immediate needs to look for our people for the for the answers, first and foremost, and the practices they are already doing to survive and to see the strength in that and not see it as a weakness. And then the question I think we have to then figure out is as organizers, you know, I'm going to use some old analysis that folks might, re you know, remember is it's a process of from the people to the people. And how do we refine that and then bring it back to people with an organizing proposal of saying, this is how we can strengthen what you're already doing to meet your immediate needs. There are alliances that have to be forged in our own context, but they're different alliances. Alliance within the black community, between different sectors of the black community, particularly different class sectors and interests in the black community, community is our primary thing that, that we've been trying to figure out, navigate, struggle through. There's also how do you ally with the Southeast Asian communities that are here? How do you ally with the Latino communities that are here? How do you ally, you know, with the, the white communities here? And then how do within that do you deal with the different class interests within all of those different communities because they're not monolithic? And then you got this overall economic dynamic. Folks from, I would call the petty bourgeois sectors are coming here gentrifying the place, you know, but they are captive to a process to but they're also driving a push-out process. So can you ally with them? Uh, and I want to run through what you're trying to do. We spoke before the break a little bit about those outside forces that uh, are, uh, are creating all sorts of impediments to achieving this vision. Community land trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a major cornerstone for us. What is that? Community land trust, you know, um, it's when we, you pull resources together to, in our case, first and foremost, acquire, you know, the vacant lands in our community, which there are far too many, thousands of them. And we've been, you know, trying to acquire as much land as possible, you know, in our community. Is this communal? This land is communal? Communal, communal ownership. So we, we buy it as, as Cooperation Jackson, you know, by pulling resources together as best we can. And for us, the, the main aim is we're trying to take as much of the property off the speculative market mm. as possible, hold it in trust for, you know, as long as we can. By law, it's, it's up to 99 years. Hold it in trust and then keep that for the community and have the community democratically run this 
space, you know, the land that we acquire. And what we're trying to do, just outright, is defeat gentrification, to keep it from coming in. We, we call what's called the fortification line. We're trying to, there's a str straight point in the community where we're trying to stop it. And underneath that, acquire as much land as we can, as fast as we can, uh, hold it in this trust, and then have the community democratically determine what are we going to do with this. The question is, from my vantage point, this is a longer question, a longer dialogue, are radical and progressive forces going to be organized enough, prepared enough to offer a real alternative when the opportunity passes? Kali Akuno is the co-founder and co-director of Cooperation Jackson. 